Straight runners versus tapered runners. What's the difference and how does this affect how we make horsepower? That's just one of the things we're gonna cover in part two of this induction series. Let's go. Uh, first, by a uh, big thank you to everyone for the comments. There's tons and tons of comments. We try to engage and reply to all of them. Uh, some really, really great ideas and people starting to understand the fundamentals and then some real mis um, misunderstandings of sort of what we're trying to explain. So uh, in this series, we're going to try and break down a few of those areas and then lead into some other things. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, Einstein Motors. And today we're actually going to demo one of the calculators that are designed uh, for our paid members. All my induction um, calculators are up on Einstein or or uh, uh, the majority of them. I have more and more coming that we are putting together from Einstein, basically just converting my spreadsheets into uh, something that can work on obviously your phone that's in your pocket. Uh, and one example obviously is the uh, MCA or average velocity that people are asking about to know what the bell velocity is. I've designed a calculator for that. So I'm gonna demo that one for you today. Um, but the first thing we're, gonna, thing we're gonna get into is a tapered runner versus straight runner and explain which is best. Let's go. All right, first thing we have to understand around runners and the difference between a tapered runner and a parallel runner is how sensitive air is to sudden changes in velocity. And by that I mean is we have a planum that feeds this runner and we're going from, let's say, 140 feet per second to 300 feet per second in a very, very short transitional period where if we look at the tapered runner, it's doing it far more gentle. So just from a density thinning mechanism, we're going to get less separation and less time lag in the runner because what we need to remember, and this is where a lot of the CFD falls short, is this is a gated switch time mechanism, meaning the valve opens, the velocity starts, accelerates, peaks, and then decels, and then the valve shuts again. And it has to start, stop every single time. Then we have wave harmonics working against us or working for us. But the important factor here is that it is a gated mechanism. So we have to harness as much as we can due to it being an accelerated path every time so we have to start every single valve event we have to start accelerating air again we have to control that thinning and with a parallel pipe we're going to get far more density thinning we're going to get this delay mechanism and we're going to create more restriction across the length the longer a pipe is the more viscous drag it has so surface drag with the molecules interacting with the boundary layer. That, that would create drag on the air. And the velocity is related to that drag. So as we increase velocity, we tend to create more drag versus more molecular collision crashing into each other, creating friction, creating heat, and so on. So with a tapered runner, this feeds into Belmuli's principle and so on. We can accelerate the air a little easier and getting back to that uh, you know, best bell theory of an elliptical type, if we use a simple radius with a taper, we get the best of both worlds without washing out that uh, signal too much with a you know elliptical bell. Uh, we can keep that the wave harmonics coming up and keep the taper within reason. You see. Most induction tapers are just absolutely crazy, especially in the forced induction era, especially coming into the early 2000s, we've seen these massive, massive growth rates, like 100% of port window over a four or five inch uh, runner, which is absolutely insane. Now, people are getting a little smarter, they're closing them up more, and we're seeing more simple radiuses. But basically, we're able to reduce the drag in that runner over a parallel runner because the airspeed is much lower through this section. So realistically, this is halving the drag of that runner because the airspeed is really only getting high in this narrow section. So this is where we're gonna get a bit of boundary swell in that area. So while it will sacrifice some of our pulse induction, some of our wave harmonics, because 
as we taper, we're adding more mass, more mass tends to soften the signal. But again, remember this is a balance between velocity and harmonics and restriction and drag basically. So uh, this will obviously be more restrictive over time. And again, the separation, the density separation, because it's wanting to go really, really fast over a really, really short period. So, and this is why sometimes you'll see uh, better results with parallel runners with an elliptical bell because that actually helps the transition, but it's not really the right way to do it. The best way obviously is tapered. This is why you see some advancements in uh, actual tapered uh, throttle bodies and stuff like that, like FI uh, hardware, they've developed some, and now we go into barrel valves and stuff like that. So generally we want the MCA as close to the bottom. All right, that takes us to the next section. Let's do it. All right, the, this takes us to the next comment and the next two comments really that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one's like, Jake, what, what, what can I do um, if I can't reach the third harmonic? In other words, what do we do in a bonnet restricted series? This is something we face all the time. And the other one was the calculation with uh, airspeed. Now I'm gonna demo that for you now. All right, so we're in the gold hub here. We'll just go down. There's a ton of uh, calculators in here, but I'll go down to the one I wanted to show you. Um, induction velocity. So the question was, if we knew a reference point, so area one, so let's, say the port's at 2.4 on average and it has a 300 feet per second average at that 2.4. Now we can go and put in our planum target, say a 4.5, hit calculate and now it's going to tell us it's around 160 feet per second. As you can see that's a little low for what this, um, if that was a true third harmonic would be. But yeah, that's just uh, an example of one of the calculators we've built for Einstein, and it's metric and imperial. And you can also use this for known flow rates. So uh, if we got 300 and C CFM at 2.8, uh, and then we have a you know 4.3 or 4.2 inch inlet, uh, it'll give us all our air speeds. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, the area ratio difference and velocity ratios as well. There you go. All right, so now you've got a good understanding of the uh, airspeed and we've shown you the calculator. Now I want to talk about the runner and how we can fudge this a little. So again, this was our example, 2.8 at the window roughly, 4.5. We've got a tapered runner, total induction length of 12 inch. So this is like an 8500 uh, RPM small block. Now, what do we do if we can't put a, let's make this a, say, a 6.5 inch above the head. What do we do? Well, there is a way to cheat it, and it'll get you 90% of the results. And we do this by necking the runner down. And a lot of people think, say, we can only run a four inch runner here. Now, a lot of people will think that the taper stays the same, we just cut it off at four inch, but that's not right at all. Now, because we have a shorter runner, we have less restriction over that distance. So what we can actually do is, we can nip that taper up a little bit. Still having some taper, but if this was three degrees, now this might be two degrees. Again, I'm not getting into specifics, but just to give you an idea. Now we've shrunk the CSA up on the small runner. So now this four inch runner will act like the six and a half inch runner because its average airspeed over that distance is back up now. We've lifted the airspeed, but because we're on a shorter runner, we don't have as much restriction, so we can afford more velocity. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just put it in the comments. I'll try and break it down again. But uh, they're the main two factors there, what we need to play with. This is why I like to talk about cross-sectional area, radial profile based on what airspeed 
that runner is seeing. Because when we talk 180 feet per second on a true third harmonic, that's only on a third harmonic length. Again, what happens when we have to shorten it, we have to narrow it, which means our relative velocity at the planum is going to be high, meaning we're going to need a slightly bigger runner. So if this runner here was 5 sixteenths, now this one, say we've gone from 180 feet down to uh, up to 220 feet per second, now this runner might need to be 3 8 or half inch. So that's another aspect you need to look at. Shorter than optimal runners will need a bigger radius. All right, so this leads us into wave harmonics and paired cylinders and common planums versus um, independent planums or twin planums you know, on V8s and stuff like that or, or oppositely opposed four cylinder, six cylinders and so on. We got into this um, and I, I was asked about whether to prioritize induction or in planum. Generally, I'll always in prioritize the primary length over planum. So we had one of the four cylinder, uh, I think it was Volkswagen guys asking about which would be better. Um, and I said, talked about the uh, firing order, which we're going to talk about now uh, and the wave harmonics they create. But generally, I'd always prioritize the um, primary length first. Getting that uh, as straight as possible and the best induction and, and sized right, I think is worth more than bending an odd fire engine to have a common planum. Again, it works in V8s because we don't need to sacrifice a hell of a lot as far as induction path go goes and still have a good, um, uh, the best of both worlds really. But in some oppositely opposed engines, obviously it can be a problem. So I would look at twin planums with maybe a balanced tube or something like that. But let's look at the board and talk about um, what's actually happening here and why it's an issue depending on the firing order. So we're just going to take a small block Chevy, make it simple. Everyone knows what that is. Uh, 1843 6572. And we're looking at bank to bank wave harmonics. Uh, so with your flat plane V8s, they're, they're an even fire. So they're left, right, left, right, left, right, which makes it so easy for exhaust and everything. That's why they have that really, really tuned high-pitched noise, not the gurgle that V8s have. The gurgle that V8s have is created by the odd fire sequencing, which I'll explain now. So what we find, and this is why V8s with an odd firing order will thrive with a common planum as long as you're not sacrificing too much in induction length, is because they're going to fire on bank one, number one cylinder then they're not going to fire on that bank for two cycles, which are eight and four. Eight and four are firing on the other bank. So while this bank is in a pause, there's nothing pulling from the planum, this bank is now pulling twice. Then we'll have a pause while the other bank draws an intake charge and vice versa for the exhaust. This could be looked at exactly the same as pulse waves coming out uh, of the exhaust. And this is why people like um, David Vizard uh, sort of come up with the idea of unequal pipe lengths to compensate for bank to bank uh, pressure indifferences. The problem with that theory is we're not looking at the energy of the wave. So if we've got a shorten a runner, extend a runner, we're going to increase its energy or decrease its energy because they're not all going to come out the same. It's like long tube headers versus short tube headers. Short tube headers are far harder to design, a big tube short, but they hit the engine much harder and we can tune them harder because we have more velocity at the collector than say a long tube does that will give us more averages, right? So this is the problem with the harmonics in the planum. We, we have to look at the firing order and, that, and a big one with the Chevys is five and seven, uh, especially when we're building a set of pipes for them. So, because we need to look at our paired cylinders. So our paired cylinders, true separation cylinders are going to be one and six, eight and five, four and seven and three and two. So when you get a 
big block Chevy, small block Chevy, even one new Z or anything, and they're pairing the back two cylinders, five and seven, uh, that's a massive no-no because they're only 90 degrees separation on one side and 270 on the other. So in one point, you gotta get, you're got you going to get a banked up pressure. And, and then on the other side of it, we're in a low for too long. Uh, and we want to optimize these lows and use them. That's why we use collectors. That was another question that come up was zoomies. Really, when you get to the point that you're making uh, 4,000 horsepower, we're not going to use a collector system to help with scavenging. So that's where zoomies will be used. But anytime you're, you're building something, you know, sub 2000 horsepower, we want to try and harness these wave harmonics. Yes, they're only worth a few percent, but every percent counts, especially in motorsport. That's why you see even in NASCAR, the early days they had four into ones. Now they've gone into two, two into one. So they're harnessing that gas energy earlier because it cools over time, it loses velocity, it loses energy, it loses punch. So uh, generally that's the way many are going. Even in the uh, high-end turbo cars now, we're seeing uh, three into one, three into one, two into one. Uh, we're picking up where we're losing velocity and keeping that energy charge to use that kinetic energy to drive that turbocharger. So. Wave harmonics is probably something we need to look at uh, and what cylinders we will uh, pair. Obviously, we want the best uh, uh, sep so even separation. And that's because generally what we're trying to do, everyone's heard the, um, the theory of back pressure. Obviously, back pressure is a fallacy because any pr additional pressure, positive pressure we have in the exhaust system takes away from atmospheric pressure. So if we have one PSI back pressure in our exhaust system, we only have available to us 13.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure. So not only do we want zero back pressure, we want negative pressure. And this is how we do it. So generally as the wave accelerates down the pipe, if I take a line through here and we'll call this atmospheric base, right? As the velocity and the pressure of the pipe shoots down in down past the collector, what it will actually do is create this negative pressure. And this is how, if you've seen ever seen the videos before where they blow air in the collector and the other cylinders will suck, well, this is this sucking mechanism that we've created with properly balanced cylinders. And this is the problem here with five and seven. The crossover is above atmospheric pressure. So we've lost pressure differential, meaning it's not going to be efficient. And I actually helped one of the Australian drag racers here. They they were actually having dramas with a plug coming out black a lot. And uh, I'm like, show me your pipes. And straight away I looked at the pipes and went, the firing order's wrong in the pipes because they had uh, a tri-wise for this engine and they'd paired the cylinders wrong. So that was causing this lack of pressure differential and lack of scavenging on that cylinder, which was causing a dirty plung, uh, plug read. And it was only on one plug. Uh, so this is really, really important if you're trying obviously to harness every bit of horsepower you can, but that's what we want to achieve, that low pressure and get that working for us in the collector, in, in to send that signal back up to the back of the valve. So now as the positive wave is um, landing at the valve, as the intake valve opens, We've got this whole uh, exhaust side in a negative pressure. So the pressure differential is greater. So it wants to fill that and clear that cylinder out. And that's how we improve our volumetric efficiency just with basic wave harmonics.